Hello, everybody. I'm delighted to welcome you to this session of the seminar on the future of the island of Ireland. We are particularly grateful to Sydney Sussex College and the Centre for Geopolitics, which sponsored this series, which has now been running for some months, I think, through COVID and now in a new and more hopeful phase within which um, we still operate online, but with the advantage of seeing people during the day and in between our meetings. Without further ado, I pass on to Barry to introduce the speakers and the session. Thank you. Thanks a million, uh, Eugenio. Indeed, it's a great pleasure to welcome everybody to this, our 16th meeting. We're nearly coming up on our, our one year anniversary, and we look forward indeed to hopefully having events uh, in person in due course. I'm just going to have a couple of words of uh, a couple of opening remarks. We're delighted to welcome John Cushnahan, who's our speaker this evening, who I'll introduce in a few moments. I should just say uh, a, a short word of, of apology for our last session, which was scheduled a fortnight ago with Tony Connolly and Catherine Barnard, which had to be postponed at short notice. It will be rescheduled. As many of you will have, have noted, Tony has been reporting from Ukraine. He was dispatched to Ukraine a fortnight ago, and apart from a short trip back to the West to see his family, he's been there doing very important reportage, and we wish him and his team the very best at this uh, difficult time indeed. It feels slightly uh, unusual speaking about anything other than the Ukraine crisis at the moment, given how serious that, that war, that conflict is, but um, bearing that in mind, we'll continue as planned. Our speaker tonight is John Cushnahan, who is a member of a very small group of people who've held high public office in both jurisdictions on the island of Ireland. John is a former student civil rights activist and general secretary of the Alliance Party from 1974 to 1982, when he was the party's only full-time politician. John was a councillor for North Belfast from 1977 to 85, and in 1982, he was elected as member of the Northern Ireland Assembly for the staunchly unionist constituency of North Down. John was appointed chairman of the Assembly Education Committee and was Alliance Party Chief Whip from 1982 to 1984 and party leader from 84 to 87. When the Unionist parties used the Assembly's procedures to oppose the Anglo-Irish Agreement in December 1985, John called on the British government to dissolve the Assembly. This terminated his income as a full-time politician. Despite this, John led the Alliance into the June 1987 Westminster election, where the party doubled its share of the vote from 5 to 10%, the tally not exceeded until 2019. John retired as Alliance leader in September 1987. In 1989, John was invited by Fine Gael to contest the European Parliament election in the strongly nationalist constituency of Munster, my home constituency. After being re-elected twice, John retired in 2004. A couple more sentences during this period in the EP, in the European Parliament. John was elected vice president of the EP Regional Policy and Foreign Affairs Committees and was EP rapporteur on Interreg, Hong Kong, Sri Lanka, Pakistan and Kashmir. John was also appointed by the European Council as head of mission to lead multinational and multidisciplinary teams in South Asia on five occasions, the objective of which was to strengthen democracy and human rights in the region. I should also add finally that John has been an enthusiastic participant at our meetings here on the Cambridge series, and I'm really happy that John's been able to accept their invitation to speak. John will be in conversation with Dr. Neave Gallagher, Associate Professor in Modern British and Irish History, and fellow of St. Cat's College at the University of Cambridge, St. Catherine's College at the University of Cambridge, and indeed co-convener of our series. Neve is author of Ireland and the Great War, a social and political history, Bloom Through 2020, which won the Royal Historical Society's Whitfield Prize. Neve is co-editor of the Political Thought of the Irish Revolution, along with Professor Richard Burke, forthcoming Cambridge University Press. Without further ado, thanks very much again for being with us, John, and the floor is yours for 10 minutes. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for tuning in to what I have to say tonight on these very important issues for both parts of Ireland and relations between both islands, Britain and Ireland. The Good Friday Agreement was indeed a, an historic achievement. It ended terrorist violence and mapped the way forward for political progress. And we are indebted to the then incumbent British and Irish governments and the local and international actors who played their part in bringing it to fruition. However, Unfortunately, complacency then set in to some extent. Uh, and we also, from a very early period, started 
de deceive ourselves about what was actually happening because we didn't want to admit it. While its greatest success was undoubtedly bringing an end to the conflict, it had nonetheless many shortcomings. It failed to deliver any substantial reconciliation measures. And despite the efforts of some committed people, attitudes are as polarized as ever. And there has been totally insufficient progress on issues such as integrated education and integrated housing. Equality of respect for the identity and culture of both traditions has yet to be achieved. A Bill of Rights, was never really considered, and supporters of the valid campaigns of loyalist and Republican terrorist organizations continue to glorify and justify their actions and continue to inflict pain and suffering on the families of their victims, denying them closure. But the biggest failure of all is the inability to deliver stable political institutions. Solving this latter point would make a contribution to help find solutions to the list of problems that I have just mentioned. The first power sharing executive under the Good Friday Agreement took office on the 2nd of December 1999, over 22 years ago. During this period, the executive has not operated, operated for 10 of these 22 years because it has collapsed on at least six occasions. Some academics would put the figure as high as nine. The core problem that exacerbated this instability emanated from the St Andrews Agreement when the method of electing the executive was changed, following which the executive had been led jointly by a first minister from Northern Ireland's largest unionist political party and a deputy first minister from its largest nationalist party. The first executive appointed, appointed onto this arrangement was led by Ian Paisley and Martin McGuinness. And this pattern continued thereafter with DU nominees for first minister and Sinn Féin nominees uh, for, for, for deputy first minister. The carve up of political power between the extremes on both sides and the total lack of trust between them created political tensions and fuller polarized the community. Both unionist and nationalist voters would forevermore vote for the strongest party on their side. As a guest speaker at the Alliance Party conference at the time, I expressed the fear then that the settlement achieved by Tony Blair and Bertie Ahern, although well-intentioned, would sacrifice the broad political center of the UUP, the SDLP and Alliance, and that future executives would continue, as they have done, lurch from one political crisis to another. Furthermore, neither the DUP or Sinn Féin were committed to reconciliation as their political power bases would have been threatened by it. The procedure for electing the executive needs to be changed and needs to be changed now to prevent further collapses of the assembly and its institutions in the future. I believe that after the assembly election in May, the British and Irish governments should discuss with all the parties who will then have received a new mandate, a new method of electing the next executive. In my view, it should be a coalition of parties that can command a two-thirds majority in, in the Assembly, provided it receives cross-community support and also shares the First Ministers on a cross-community basis. The British government, learning from the experience of previous executives, should also insist uh, that it must implement policies promoting reconciliation, equality of respect, human rights, and so on. And if it fails to do so, then they must do it for them. In relation to a border poll, the Northern Ireland, Northern Ireland Act 1998 provides that, quote, if at any time it appears likely that the majority of those voting would express a wish that Northern Ireland should cease to be part of the United Kingdom and form part of a United Ireland, end quotes, the Secretary of State shall enable a border poll. However, it is vague about the criteria for doing so, and any review of the Good Friday Agreement should address this particular issue. Furthermore, if we are to avoid repeating the mistakes of a century ago, we must recognize that if we establish political institutions based on simple majoritarian, majoritarianism again, we would inevitably experience the same disastrous consequences. Because of past experience, therefore, I would suggest that the holding of a border poll should be triggered by a request from a future Northern Ireland Assembly, provided it is approved by two thirds of its members. If such a threshold is to be achieved, it would require the support and consent of a significant number of unionist assembly members. Let me raise another past mistake from which we must learn. 
This mistake was not of our making, but it had disastrous consequences, not only for Northern Ireland, but, but the island as a whole and relationships between Britain and Ireland. This mistake happened not a century ago, but several years ago. And of course, this was the holding of a referendum on Brexit by our nearest neighbor. This, this decision, despite its importance, and it was of critical importance, was preceded by little or no attempt to inform the electorate about the real rather than imaginary issues that were involved or the consequences that would flow from it, whatever decision they would eventually make. Therefore, prior to any border poll taking place, we must ensure that the electorates in both parts of Ireland are fully informed beforehand. And I don't mean on the eve of the poll. The process of educating them should take place now. Up to now, the campaign for a border poll has been led by Sinn Féin and its supporters. Regrettably, it has consisted mainly of sloganising, but has offered no real, no, no detail or substance or uh, how it can be achieved. Furthermore, the fact that they have shown little respect for the unionist tradition or British identity is totally counterproductive. This is all the more worrying when if, as the opinion polls are predicting, that after the next election in both parts of Ireland, Sinn Féin will be the largest nationalist party on the island of Ireland. I believe that this will be the case. While such an endorsement will obviously confer an important status on them in relation to the debate on the future of the island, of the island it will also place on them an important responsibility to unequivocally prove, prove that they will actually support the principle that the unionist tradition will be treated respectfully and equally in any future all-Ireland arrangement. However, my fear is that Sinn Féin are simply merely replicating the Boris Johnson campaign on Brexit, where both are cynically exploiting narrow nationalisms for electoral advantage. For the reasons just mentioned, it is therefore of vital importance that the debate is inclusive and informed. And for that reason, I think the academic community should lead it, but not in a prescriptive way. The British and Irish governments should fund an inter-university project involving universities from Northern Ireland, the Republic of Ireland and Britain. The task should be to provide a detailed anal analysis of the options without coming to conclusions about any particular one of them. I'm well aware that a number of universities, especially your own, are involved in different projects relating to Ireland and its future. However, what they are doing and the valuable information they accumulate, accumulate does not necessarily reach the general, general public who will actually make the final decision in any future border poll. I would say it probably doesn't even arrive on the desks of parliamentarians in Britain and Ireland. Additionally, I believe it would be better if this research expertise and analysis was coordinated under one academic uh, umbrella. The project could be set specific areas of research under the various political stroke and institutional stroke constitutional options, for example. Firstly, within the current constitutional uh, structure, consideration of proposals to strengthen all Ireland cooperation in the educational, health, social and economic and any other relevant fields. Secondly, and obviously uh, the main sensitive one, under any All-Ireland constitutional arrangement, they could explore governance options like a unitary state, federal state, confederal state, then how each of these options would be financed, including fundings of pensions and defence or things which are not often men mentioned. Also, they could consider what necessary legislative and structural changes would be required and make proposals for protection for the rights of minorities in the government, culture and citizenship. And one favorite uh, idea of mine in the past, a proposal for a political right of appeal. Thirdly, continued monitoring, monitoring of further possible shocks that would impact on the process as, 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 uh, as Brexit did. And one obvious one comes to my mind, if Scottish independence uh, was to happen. If this were to happen, and if one thinks outside the box, would there be merit in considering a structure involving Northern Ireland, Republic of Ireland and Scotland as a Western arc of the European Union and adopting similar interparliamentary structures as those that operate under the Nordic Council? The, ob the object of this rolling academic project would be to prevent or would be to present their papers to the Doyle, the Assembly and Westminster for consideration by their relevant committees. They should also be presented simultaneously to public bodies, civil society and the media. 
And in making this proposal, I, I believe that all of these actions should inform the public and encourage a constructive and ongoing debate well in advance of any border poll that might eventually take place. Thank you. Thanks very much, John. Most, uh, most engaging as always. I'll hand straight over to Niamh. Niamh, please quiz John. Brilliant. Um, thank you, John. Thank you very much. Very nice to be here and be with you all again. Um, John, thanks for that. I have some obviously specific questions in relation to it, but I thought I would begin a little more broadly so we can widen the net about the Alliance Party as a whole. So I was wondering in your view, I mean, you served as the Alliance Party leader, what is different between the Alliance Party of today and the one that you helped to grow back in the late 70s and early 80s? I don't think there's any difference. Uh, uh, the, uh, the prospect for it is looking much better uh, because unfortunately the times that uh, a period I was in it was probably the most was the head of the troubles and uh, the decade in which I was I was uh, involved as leader and, and prior to that chief whip was was the most polarized but all of the proposals that I have uh, seen them making are, 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 I don't disagree with any of them and I just think that they are taking the proposals and the principles of the party and the and 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 the commitment that the party has uh, and adapting it to the particular challenges it faces today. So I've, there's nothing I certainly disagree with. And politics, as we all know, is an evolving situation. And I think under the leaders that succeeded me, and especially under the current leader, they have done that very, very well. And I, all the indications would seem to be that they should make a significant breakthrough in the next assembly election. Okay, yeah, great. But I wonder, John, I mean, there have been some differences, if I might just flag the red horse of the, um, of the union. And would it be fair to say that when the Alliance Party was initially set up, it was a pro-union, quite articulately pro-union party, whereas since then it's taken a much more neutral position on, on, the, on the union itself. I was wondering if you might comment on, on that. I'm absolutely delighted to comment that. Obviously, when it was formed, it was addressing the conflict, so to speak, and it, it had to develop a political appeal and a set of principles on which it could uh, ask both sections of the community to vote for it. And what it adapted uh, was not an ideology in the sense of which you're talking about unionism or, or nationalism. What it adopted was, in my view, a historic compromise. That was a compromise, one, that it accepted the union uh, as long as that was the decision, the majority decision of the uh, people of Northern Ireland. But in return for that, there had to be power sharing. And that was a historic compromise in which it moved forward. Uh, and, and for example, uh, I know that people will talk about, you know, it now designates itself as other in, in the things, but go back to the 80s, the period that I was most involved in. Uh, we addressed all, similar issues, which were not unionist or nationalist. They were essentially addressed to both communities. For example, the very first initiative that I launched as leader was uh, and then the proposals for an interparliamentary tier. And of course, the biggest challenge which defined my leadership was despite the fact that the Alliance Party was divided at the time, and by the way, it wasn't divided along religious lines, which might surprise some people, uh, was to encourage the party. I mean, our parliamentary party and the assembly was divided on it, uh, uh, but not along religious lines. They were concerned about the way in which it was conceived, that it wasn't done on the basis of consent, but it was divided right down the middle. Uh, but uh, I and others persuaded them at the governing uh, council of the party, which makes the decisions, to give qualified support to the uh, Anglo-Irish agreement on a vote of 139 votes to two. So what I'm saying to you in response to your thing, we were not and never were a unionist party, and I've never been comfortable with, with a description to do that. It was often used by our opponents, uh, particularly our opponents on the nationalist side, to undermine our credibility. At all times, our policy was based on the core respect for both traditions in Northern Ireland. Okay, interesting. But I want to just come back on that a little bit, John. Um, no, and pleasure. I think, yeah, uh, you're, you're, you're right. Um, these labels, unionism, nationalism, have been politicized and they're very loaded and um, they are used and deployed in different ways. Would it not, though, still be fair to say that the Alliance is a soft unionist party? It's one that wants Northern Ireland to work. 
And in order to work, it needs money. And a lot of that money comes from Westminster. Most of the jobs in Northern Ireland are state-led jobs, civil service, for example, healthcare, education, whatever it may be, um, less education. Anyway, do you not think it would still be fair to say that it would be more or less a soft unionist party rather than a kind of big U, um, big U unionist, unionist party? What would you say to that? No, I, I, don't, I don't accept it's a soft or ever was a soft unionist party. Its basic position is that it wants to promote reconciliation. And in promoting reconciliation, it has to acknowledge the political realities. And the Alliance Party has never, ever, in all my involvement in it, run away from those realities. It's always faced the crunch decisions. It faced the crunch decision of the hunger strike, which was not a popular, uh, a popular position to take, with, you know, in terms of a party which had a significant part of its base in the Catholic community. Equally, it faced a very difficult challenge and faced in relation to the Anglo-Irish Agreement. So the core of what the Alliance Party is about is a reconciliation. And in that sense, in addressing those that's that's where its policy emerges from. No, I don't accept the description. But let me say, and, and, and been sensitive about this point, uh, I have huge respect for the unionist and nationalist traditions. And it, it, it is always my view and the view of all those that succeeded me, that whatever was done had at the center of its policy position respect for both traditions equally. Not for the actions of some unionists uh, or the actions of some nationalists, but for un people, ordinary people in Northern Ireland who were either unionist or nationalist. They were the ones we tried our best to represent and to represent and address their fears. Great, well, then maybe that brings me on to thinking a bit about the electorate in, in Northern Ireland today and some of the reasons why the Alliance Party has done well, particularly since 2019 and in a whole variety of different elections. Um, I mean, how far do you think that electorate has changed today between the one that you represented in the 70s and 80s to the one that's actually coming to the polls today and, and putting Alliance um, as their first or second preference? How different are the voters today in Northern Ireland than they were? Well, it, it has changed to some extent, and in other senses, it hasn't changed at all. Look, look at the reaction to the protocol, uh, and, and uh, it's been stronger than any of us could have imagined, and it's causing problems. Uh, look at the situation where, uh, when I was involved in politics, Sinn Féin abstained from everything, and now, as I've already mentioned, they're likely to be not only the largest nationalist party, but the largest party on the island of Ireland. So it's, it's changed. And, 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 and there are the issues that, that, that Alliance are go going to have to address. But I think it's, I, I, I think in the last series of elections and certainly European election, which was a phenomenal performance for Naomi Long, a lot of the credit is due to herself, you know, as well. But there, I think obviously the behavior of the traditional parties uh, helped Alliance eat into ground they had hitherto for not any, got any support. And I'm hoping that that momentum is continuing. So I think the at least the environment in which they face the next election uh, is, is not as polarized as it had been under previous leaders. Uh, uh, and they have an opportunity of expanding that base. And maybe maybe I just hope that people in the among the non-electorate have got fed up with 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 what the main parties are doing and recognize that there's never going to be any permanent peace in Northern Ireland unless there's a change in voting patterns. And I'm not just saying that that has to be voting pattern changes to the benefit of the Alliance Party. I've always believed in the importance of the centre, and I've never ever defined the centre as simply the Alliance Party. For me, the centre was stretching from moderate unionism as represent, represented by the Ulster Unionist Party and its, pre, and, its, and its previous guys, right through Alliance, right to the SDLP. And unless the majority in Northern Ireland are prepared to back that broad centre, there's always going to be these sort of crises. So hopefully that's not just a challenge facing the lands. Maybe that's what they will benefit from in the forthcoming assembly election. And hopefully also what the Ulster Unionist Party will benefit from in taking votes, in my view, away from the DUP and the SDLP in taking votes away from Sinn Féin. Well, this broad centre that you mentioned, I mean, I think there's plenty of evidence to support that. The Northern Ireland Life and Times survey, for example, demonstrating that more people 
identified as not unionist or not uh, nationalist in, in Northern Ireland and respectively um, either nationalist or unionist. So that goes in favor of this broad center approach. But I therefore was wondering why you still talk about two traditions, two different peoples, when this evidence would suggest actually there seems to be fracturing here in terms of political allegiance and identity. Um, do you have any views on sort of reconciling these two things? See, I... I wouldn't. I wouldn't think it's totally fracturing. I mean, one of the things that has always been my belief about Northern Ireland. I've always believed in a Northern Irish identity. I always felt that in Northern Ireland that we we had much more in common than either Unionists had with the United Kingdom or Nationalists had with Northern Ireland. And maybe that's what's that's what's coming to the fore now. Uh, but also, I, I suspect that, and I welcome. I welcome that those emerging trends but i suspect it's also in response to the sterility and sectarianism of the traditional political parties and particularly those at the top of the heaps on either team uh, top of the pile on on, on, on either community mm -hmm. okay and then sort of the final question really by um the alliance party doing well since 2019 do you think, therefore, that this is a reflection of, just as you said, the sterility of the main political parties, or perhaps there's other factors that might explain it, such as the Alliance Party's position in the recent Brexit referendum, for example, or perhaps even a sort of broader based ideological dealignment across Northern Ireland, people having political allegiances based on other types of, of factors. So which factor would you say is, is the most important one or indeed series of factors? Well, I thought it touched on that. I'm sorry if it didn't. I mean, I think the 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 party stance, which would anyway would always been a historical stance on on, on on European issues, was the critical breakthrough, and 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 the, and 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 the reaction of the other parties provided an enormous platform for them, uh, and and in particular, I think that uh, support put them in a position of gaining significant support from the unionist community, which enable them to get above other parties like the Ulster Unionist Party and the SDLP to avail of transfer. So it's the critical thing about transfers is that you stay long enough in the electoral race to gain from them. Now, that's one aspect of it. And that's breaking the credibility barrier. So it is. For a long time in the 90s, the party's vote, uh, unfortunately, went down as low as 3.5%. 7%, which is, I think, what it reached in one assembly election. Uh, and, and, and under Naomi and Stephen Farry and, 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 other, and, and others, they managed to make that credibility breakthrough. It's a breakthrough which uh, went to many alliance conferences and I hope to be attending the one next week, which they talked about breaking the, what is it, the, 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 the ceiling, the mirror and the ceiling, and they broke it. And they haven't established that credibility uh, factor. Then people will not see a vote for alliance as a wasted vote. That's an important psychological breakthrough in politics to have achieved, but also the policies they have adopted. They're progressive uh, social and economic policies. They're, 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 you know, and, and, and the strong stance they've adopted on issues like gay rights and everything else. All of, the, all of those combined together. But the platform, I think, which led the basis for it to happen was what happened in the European election. Okay, great. Thanks, John. I want to turn briefly to, to British parliamentary politics. So I know the Alliance has had a well, quite a long-standing relationship with the, the Lib Dems, or at least have an alliance with, with them. I wonder if you could just tell us a bit about how that came about. And then my second question is, is it really a case of unrequited love? Because I don't really hear the Lib Dems speaking about the Alliance, whereas I might hear the Alliance mention the Lib Dems. Well, let me certainly answer that question. It was myself that started the um, relationship with the Lib Dems. So it was. I'll tell you a bit about that. But not only did I start a relationship with the Lib Dems, I also started a relationship with Southern political parties. So the reality was that the constitutional situation was that the Lib Dems were in the same uh, constitutional framework as we were, but obviously parties in the South was. And my purpose was to broaden our influence to the Republic of Ireland, but also to where the main decisions about Northern Ireland were being made at that time, which was, of course, in the UK. The reason I, I politically, I would be a left to centre politician. I'd have been happy in Neil Kinnock's party. I was a big hero. He was my big hero uh, at that time. Uh, and I was on the left in, in, in student politics. But I thought the 
the SDP Liberals. It was the SDP Liberals I started the relationship, by the way, with not the Lib Dems. As you know, the Lib Dems uh, came afterwards. And the reason I thought they were ideal was because they reflected together the ideology you know, of the Alliance Party, because the Alliance Party had conservatives, uh, liberals and socialists, you know, and I thought, in a sense, they reflected uh, what would keep all sections in the party happy. And of course, their policies are very committed to Europe, which Alliance always was too. So I, I felt that they provided, you know, a, a, a sister party at a national level into which we could feed and give influence to, and as they shape their policies, particularly in relation to, to, to Northern Ireland. So that was that was the strategy. And that was going very well when people like Shirley Williams and, uh, and Roy Jenkins and so on were there. But it came to a halt when David Owen was not too keen on it because David Owen wanted to leave the option open to do a deal with either Unionists or nationalists at Westminster to form a government. And when that happened, I pulled back from it. I was very annoyed. I wasn't annoyed with the liberal segment of it, but I was very annoyed that the SDP, who were supposed to be a principal party, were prepared to prostitute themselves in order to gain office in the United Kingdom. And I had no time for that. But that didn't stop us maintaining a very good relationship uh, right up until the 87 Westminster election and, 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 and fighting on a common platform. It was originally supposed to be a common manifesto, but David Owen's attitude was the, the, the attitude which put a break on it. Now, I left in 87, but the party did have an ongoing and still does have an ongoing relationship. And I think it's, it's, it's a very positive relationship, but Naomi, when she went to Westminster for her reason, decided, to, uh, decided not to take their whip. Former leader, John Allardyce, decided to take the Lib Dem. So I suppose, in a sense, I'm confirming what I'm saying to you. It shows that not only were, could you necessarily define the Alliance Party as unionist or nationalist, you can neither define it as socialist, liberal, or conservative. It was, it, 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 it represents a very, uh, wide tradition of ideological beliefs, as it did also uh, uh, yeah. issues like nationalism and unionism. Yeah, no, that, that's that's quite clear, John. Thanks. Um, I I am wondering, however, uh, even though you've talked about this sort of narrative of a relationship and these sort of close links, etc., still it comes to the point that when you live in Britain, you have not heard. I have certainly not heard the Liberal Democrats talk about the Alliance Party, or indeed kind of maintain that connection, or use that connection in any of their media outings, or whatever it might be, which reflects more broadly a lack of interest in many British parliamentary politics in Northern Ireland as a whole. I was just wondering what your views were on that or are on that, and uh, the complete actual dissociation between between the two that is so obvious to, to those of us who live here today. Well, I, I... I thought, maybe I'm wrong, I thought Stephen Farray is associated with the Lib Dems, but I may be wrong in that. Um, so I stand to be corrected in that. But I think it should be using its, 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 its relationship. Uh, the, the, the Lib Dems may, much, may be a lot smaller than it was, but there's still an important influence uh, in Westminster. And I would think the function of any party in Northern Ireland uh, or the intention of any party in Northern Ireland wants to influence national decisions, uh, just as the DUP did with the present government for all the, uh, with unfortunately all the wrong consequences, then other parties like the SDLP and Alliance should be seeking to influence not only a particular party, it should be seeking to influence the wider spectrum of British politics into doing what is right and necessary in Northern Ireland. But I, I would have thought that the Alliance Party were continuing to do that, and I would have thought that and I don't know the answer to this. I don't know what relationship they have, um, excuse me, with, with John Allardyce, who's, who's, the, who's the leader of the, of, of, of the Liberals in the House of Lords. Yeah, sorry, John, maybe I should be more clear. Uh, this wasn't the sort of comments on the Alliance Party, but more from the other side of things, from British parliamentary politics oh, in general. The Labour Party, the Conservative Party, indeed the Lib Dems, and, and a, a sort of a lack of knowledge. Uh, consistent lack of knowledge about Northern Irish and Northern Irish affairs and just what your views were on that. Well, it's a two-way process. I mean, all, I mean, certainly from all the parties in Northern Ireland should be doing that and attracting 
many more people from the UK Parliament to come over and learn firsthand what's happening. They turn up uh, uh, at some occasions. I mean, they did it as Brexit became a reality and appeared, been interviewed by Northern Ireland television reporters on the border and so on. But it should be a much more ongoing process. But, you know, there really isn't. Uh, I mean, if Northern Ireland's going well, then really none of the British parties get involved. It's only when it, uh, another crisis is created, they seem to engage. But the, it's up to the non. I mean, unfortunately, the ones that have been best at it in recent times have been the DUP, and that's been to the major disadvantage. But here's another instance: we wouldn't be in this mess on Brexit if Sinn Féin had taken their seats. At times, any observer of the Westminster scene, there were key votes lost. Some by as low as three and seven seven votes, particularly two from Ken Clark, and I think it was March and April in 2019, which would have kept the UK not only in the single market, you know, not only in the single market, but 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 in the economic union. And uh, and and if that had been done, we wouldn't have faced the crisis that we have faced on 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 Brexit, because, and I don't know. Sinn Féin says, oh, it's a policy of principle. It's always been a policy of principle for Sinn Féin abstentionism, and they have abandoned it at every opportunity. And one other point I would make is that in the Good Friday Agreement, it says that all parties, endorsed by the populations of both sides, accept the reality of Northern Ireland's constitutional position. And Sinn Féin and abstaining are refusing to accept the legitimacy of something which they signed up to. Okay, I think you've, you've got strong, strong views on that one, John. I can see that coming across for sure. Um, I think at this point, I'm, I'm going to transfer over to Barry. He's going to... Um, he's going to uh, thanks a million, Neil. We'll probably yeah. come, come back to you in due course. But John, thanks a million for, for how frank and, and honest and, and entertaining your, your interventions have been. Um, you've done more than most to build bridges north, south, and east, west in British politics and Irish politics. And... Um, what Eve was talking about there is something that kind of drives our whole, our whole series that oftentimes you'd encounter just a real lack of, of awareness or understanding in Britain, a place I, I, I love, uh, but like a real lack of understanding about what's happening in, in politics in Northern Ireland or in the Republic, which is why we kind of sustain this series. So uh, your kind of response to that last question, I think, was really, really notable. I'm going to ask you two questions, but one of them now. I'm going to ask one now, then pass over to Professor Biagini, and then we have some from the audience as well, which we'll go to. I'm looking at the, the topic of your, of, your, of your speech tonight was revisiting the Good Friday Agreement and the conditions necessary for holding a border poll. I want to ask you something about the Good Friday Agreement, that during your speech you reflected on the biggest failure of all is the inability for us to deliver stable political institutions in, in Northern Ireland. And you reflect on the risks associated with founding political institutions based on simple majoritarianism, which I'm sure most people will agree with. But what I'm wondering about is, can, can those wrongs be righted within the confines of the Good Friday Agreement as is by either reasserting it or reinterpreting it? You know, the Good Friday Agreement is a famously kind of flexible document in some ways. Do you think it can be, like, can its provisions be, be used to correct these shortcomings or does it have to be remade, do you think, John? No, well, I think, I mean, I think it have offered some suggestions. They, it has to be, I don't, I don't think we just discard the Good Friday Agreement. Uh, I mean, the, the title is review it, see where it's defected and, 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 and make corrective decisions. I mean, the central theme of, of, of the Good Friday Agreement, and its central issue is about stable political institutions uh, and power sharing institutions. And although they have, got the two largest parties into the executive. It is not, that was not the intention. It was to get a cross community government operating on behalf of the people of Northern Ireland. And I think that the starting point is to find some other method of, of, of electing the executive, as I've already mentioned. But I don't think it, I don't think we should ever discard the, the Good Friday Agreement. Uh, but it's up to politicians in the modern age to carry on, not not, not, not abandon the work that has been achieved, but to carry on and, in fact, implement what was intended. I mean, the problem is that an awful lot was intended about the Good Friday Agreement has not been implemented. It's not that it was necessarily fundamentally wrong in its architecture. It just needs tweak, but it needs tweak on some major issues. 
explain, John. I'm just having a, a peek into the questions and answers box. So I'm going to hold on to my second question because it's for the audience to ask their questions. Before that, I'm going to pass over to Eugenio. And if we have time, we'll come back to my question about a border poll and the Republic. Eugenio. Thank you. Thank you, John, for such a thought-provoking uh, paper and presentation. And I must say, I'm very impressed by the, the, the argument you put forward, especially uh, on the point of uh, how to build co working coalitions which go beyond the party government, which we've had so far, or non-government as the case may be. And the idea that a coalition of parties, they command a two thirds majority in the assembly with um, cross community support across the uh, country, across the province should be the, the new criterion instead of rewarding just the largest parties. I wonder whether you can expand on this a little bit more. For example, to what extent can this help the electorate to move beyond the existing party system, or at least to provoke perhaps existing parties to think in, in, in new and, and more original ways, more in ways which are more representative of actual opinion in the, in, in the province about issues such as civil rights, civil rights for minorities, civil rights for new Irish or new Northern Irish, if you like, and all sorts of other groups. I think two is the experience of working with other parties has a, a contribution to make to changing pe people's attitudes in, in other parties. And the, I mean, the problem about the current executive is it is created, I mean, the two main parties can continue uh, with their very negative policies, but they're still going to hold the top two posts in the executive. In order to get a two-thirds majority, in, uh, uh, as I propose in a, in a future executive, there has got to be compromises on key issues. You only have to look at what's happened down here. Who would have ever thought it possible that the two civil war parties were going to be worked, working together and working together successfully? And they're working together at, critical, uh, at a critical history of, of, of this part of Ireland. And there has been, well, they're still retaining their own identity. There has been a significant change of attitudes. No one would have thought it possible that the personalities and policies would have been able uh, to be represented so coherently and strongly and unitedly by the three parties in the current government in the South. And if it can be done here, there's no reason why it, it, it can't be replicated in, in, in Northern Ireland. The Rubicon was crossed in the, Repub crossed in the Republic and that has changed attitudes among voters in both parties who wouldn't probably have transferred any of their votes to the other main civil war party. That is changing. It'll be interesting to see whether going forward in this part in, in, in this part of Ireland, whether there will be a joint approach by both Fine Gael and Fine Fáil, and of course, including, including the Greens to seek re-election, which, which in itself would never have, have, have been credible. So I think that's an experience. And of course, if you look right across the European continent, the parties who were fundamentally opposed to each other, not, not only uh, on, on many issues, are working together in many of the most stable governments in the rest of the European Union. And there's no reason why Northern Ireland can do, cannot do the same thing, particularly when we have had for a long period of time a relative of peace, but a peace that hasn't been copper fastened and a peace that, that, that has not managed to persuade a lot of people away from very negative and sectarian policies. Thank you. Well, in the South, many of the step forwards in, in civil rights, especially, were achieved through referenda. I'm thinking by civil rights, I think of things such as divorce, um, um, uh, same, same sex marriage, and many other causes related to individual liberty. I wonder whether there is a way in which the Southern Irish referendum approach, the Swiss referendum approach, could be a way to go beyond party, um, party alliances and party you know, uh, fronts in the, in the north, associated as they are with the sectarian divides. Yes, I think I think it's possible. It's worth if 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 there is a block 
in an Northern Ireland assembly against these things. Well, of course, the other thing that at this point I touched upon, uh, it's up to, I think the sovereign government should sort it out if it's one particular intransigent group in, in, in an Northern Ireland assembly has prevented it. But I think the use of referendums is another possible way because it would seem, uh, and certainly who it's been the case in the Republic that, that, that attitudes to divorce and, and gay rights uh, seem to be opposed by the establishment, certainly the established church and everything else, but there was a revolt from the general public, and that encouraged politicians uh, to become involved and lead that debate along with a lot of people in civil society. So I think it's something worthwhile worthwhile looking at, as I do do also in terms of constitutional issues. Maybe 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 it wouldn't be a bad thing to have preferendums and, and so on as well to see where the land lies. But at the end of the day, I think it's it's liable to be more much more concrete if politicians are leading it and leading people uh, away from their historic uh, tribalism and everything too. But I think it's well worthwhile considering the use of referendums to, to achieve things where, where one particular part of maybe an executive is the stumbling block. I don't think any particular part should have a block, should, should, should have a veto in progress, particularly if the majority opinion in the community is for much more liberal or whatever the issue is, outlook then, all the more reason to, that provision should be made for putting it to the public and the public forcing the, the political leadership to implement it. I would be very much sympathetic to that sort of idea. It has worked here in the Republic and it could it could work in Northern Ireland and it's certainly worthwhile trying. Thank you. Well, one way forward is surely to reassure the minority in the future, whatever minority it is, it is the side which is likely to lose a referendum on the, on the border. Um, about the outcome of this referendum. And I wonder whether there are lessons to learn from other European countries, particularly Belgium, where of course the divide between Walloons and the, and the, Flem and the Flemish are, is, is deep, is important, and could have split up the country many times, but it has not. And there are also devices to ensure that each of the two sides will be duly respected in the allocation of funds. For example, research funds is one area in which I've been involved, but many other areas can be treated in the same way. I wonder whether you have any reflections on the case of Belgium or, or other countries in terms of balancing the rights and concerns of different groups. Well, I mean, Belgium is a particular place. I mean, some people would argue that there's still a lot of problems in Belgium uh, that, that need to be overcome, and of course, if you look at German unification, I mean, I would have thought that German unification would have been something which we could have learned from on the island of Ireland. But I was surprised at some occasions in the past when uh, I was told, particularly by people coming from Eastern Germany and a person I respect, uh, you know, very much. And th they were strongly putting the point to me that really the unity unification of Germany has not been as successful as people think. I don't know enough about it to elaborate on that, but I was quite surprised at that. But coming back to one of the other points you made, I mean, one of the key lessons of a hundred years ago was establishing majority rule in the North, which totally ignored the rights of the minority and discriminated against it. That's why I feel so strongly in the debate about a Porter poll, that it mustn't be, the, the, the conclusion mustn't be one which replicates that situation. The only difference is a role reversal. Instead of a nationalist minority uh, in, 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 in Northern Ireland, it becomes a unionist minority in an All-Ireland settlement uh, whose rights are not respected equally. And my fear, when I look at some of the things, some of the, I repeat again, the, 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 the agenda of Sinn Féin, who have had many opportunities to show that they respect the unionist and British tradition, even in the simple erection of a stone monument to celebrate the centenary of, a, of, of, of or to commemorate, I should say, commemorate, not celebrate, commemorate the centenary of, of the establishment of Northern Ireland, that that was blocked by Sinn Féin. Yet, uh, uh, there was a commemoration of, of the work of the GAA in the same grounds of Stormont. Where, where was the reciprocation? You know, so there's got to be 
any any future, if there is ever to be an All Ireland solution, there's got to be a recognition that it's not going to be a situation where unionists are going to find themselves in the role that nationalists did in the foundation of 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 of, of, of the Northern Ireland state. And if you look at all the opinion polls um, that have been held on the issue of reunification, well, I don't never use the term reunification, unification of Ireland. Mm-hmm. It's fairly thoroughly depressing. I mean, I only quote two recent ones. For example, uh, the it was one in the uh, Business Post. I think it was in, uh, in in November last year. It showed that it showed that sixty percent would vote in favour of of of, of, of Irish unification. But for example, that would reduce to forty one percent. If people had to pay for it, but more more significantly in terms of equality, uh, there was a strong majority in that opinion poll, which to- were totally opposed, and especially among young people, were totally opposed to changing the national anthem and 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 and, and changing the flag. There was one in the Irish Times once again. Sixty-two uh, percent were in favour of if, if there was a referendum for a united Ireland. Same themes came up again. This was, in, I think, in, in January this year, that they would oppose, and but it was eighty percent of Sinn Féin voters in particular, by the way, they once again would not make any concession to unionism on a new flag or, or a new national national anthem. And John, I'm, I'm going to interrupt you just quickly, okay. if I may, because okay, just, just to finish question. one one simple yeah, point, please. and they wouldn't even concede ministers from the unionist tradition. In a government in Ireland, that's how far we've got to go to persuade unionists that an all Ireland future will treat, an all Ireland structure will, will treat them equally. Sorry, okay. Barry. Long way to go, not at all. Uh, John has written widely on these topics in all the Irish broadsheets. If you Google uh, John's name and the Examiner and the Irish Times, the Independent, you'll find his, uh, his reflections. We've had a, a number of questions come in, John, from the audience that I want to put you in the time that remains. I've put them into three groups, right? So the first one is on the DUP. I'm going to ask two questions together. The first comes from Des Atkinson from the University of Exeter. How are you, Des? Des asks, what is John's assessment of the DUP? Will they continue to have the support of the majority of the unionist community? Relatedly, Dennis Loretto, welcome, Dennis, says, and it's a bit lengthy, so let me get through it quickly. A poll earlier this month carried out by Lucid Talk for QUB covered a range of issues around the protocol. An interesting aspect was a question on how parties were trusted to manage the protocol issue. Only the alliance had a net positive result of plus 2%. Sinn Féin were minus 21. The shock result was DUP, a remarkable net minus 51. Would you agree with, Dennis, um, that it is time for the UK government to move away from kowtowing to the DUP on NI issues, end quote? I think uh, and, uh, each time you pick up a newspaper on the first question on the DUP, I think they're going to lose support. Um, like there's no, uh, they, uh, there's no way they're not going to lose support. Uh, uh, and uh, I think it's going to pave the way for Sinn Féin being the largest party in, in, in Northern Ireland. Sorry, um, um, the second part of that question, Barry, could you repeat again? The second part of the second question, John. Well, the first question. The first question was merely, um, will they continue to have the support of the majority of the unionist community? Oh, yes, I, I think they will have the support of a majority of the unionist community, but it will be a diminished majority support. Uh, and, and I think that's a positive thing. If we are to have progress, as Verdi said, it's, it's, it's very important that the Ulster unionists increase its support. And they're offering a clear and more constructive alternative. And one of the speakers I was most impressed with in, in, in this series was Doug Beatty. And I thought he was very open and very frank and, and certainly offered a, an alternative uh, type of policy to what the DUP's negative policies were doing. In, in, in relation to Dennis Loretto's uh, point about... It was the, the same problem. question, John, but pertaining to the UK government, especially whether the UK government should stop kind of conceding to the DUP. Yeah, yeah, yeah. well, absolutely. I mean, I think the, the totally wrong thing for, is for any government, any guarantor, let me say not only any British government, but any British or Irish government, uh, who are supposed to be guarantors of the Good Friday Agreement, even with its imperfections, should be in hock to any of the tribal parties in Northern Ireland. That inhibits its ability to rise above uh, 
people who support it might need in the Westminster Parliament, and it will pander to their own self-interest instead of doing what's right in Northern Ireland. And that's precisely what has happened to some extent under Boris Johnson's government. I don't think any, any British government should be ob obligated to in any way side with one, not only one side of the Northern Ireland community, but one section of one side, they should be above uh, the conflict, and they should be working with everyone else, including the Irish government, to do what is best and not making expedient political decisions to keep them either in office or secure office for themselves. Thanks, John. Two questions I'll yog together as well on the theme of reconciliation, something you reflect upon. From Fergal McCarthy, Harry Fergal. Fergal says, can you please ask John what reconciliation efforts could be used in the Northern Ireland context that we have witnessed being used in other post-conflict societies? What are your views on the use of official apologies in the Northern Ireland context? Relatedly from Philip McGarry, former Alliance chair, who may be known to you. Philip says, quote, Sinn Féin are unapologetic about IRA violence. How far, how far does John see this as undermining the chances for genuine political reconciliation? What are the options for reconciliation to what extent does IRA violence undermine its prospects? Well, the 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 I would like to see much more commitment to policies which bring about reconciliation. At this stage, twenty years after the Good Friday Agreement, we 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 have a number of so-called peace walls, which are the greatest misnomer, because they're not peace walls. They're keeping warring factions apart. There's still a hundred of them left. So I'd want to see how policies could be developed, particularly in those respects, uh, uh, to, to encourage people to, to, to adopt attitudes where those walls could be brought down. And I remember when I was on the Board of Cooperation in Ireland, our attitudinal service, this is some years ago, showed that attitudes were worse at that point in time, this was about 2010, then they were at the head of the troubles. So policies which promote understanding and reconciliation and very important ones to which I've already referred, integrated education. Is, and I mean, even the, the president of Ireland engaged in that recently, uh, criticizing, uh, uh, you know, the church for its, any any of the churches for its objection to it. And anybody, anybody was opposing integrated uh, education and also, uh, the issue of integrated housing. Why hasn't it been made? Why hasn't it been progressed? And one of the starts, by the way, they could make in terms of integ in integrated housing, the, the, the public bodies responsible should make sure all the paramilitary murals are removed and removed immediately. They only map out Terry as a dog that maps out its territory and encourage continued seg seg segregation. On the second and third questions, which are related about apologies, how can anybody expect reconciliation in Northern Ireland when the paramilitaries on both sides continue to glorify and justify their campaigns of violence. That causes immense pain to those families and there will never be reconciliation while they continue to do, to do that. And I think that they should apologize for their pasts and they should also state quite clearly and unequivocally that they would hope should there never be any group or organization in Northern Ireland that uses violence for the achieving of political objectives when any political objective can be achieved through normal democratic means. And the most important thing that apologies would do would give some comfort to the 3,000 people, 3,000 families whose, whose, whose relatives were slaughtered in the troubles. And that would be an important psychological first step. John, uncharacteristically, we're going to we're going to run over by a couple of minutes, audience, just by three or four minutes. So if anyone needs to leave, obviously, uh, apologies. But the reason for that is Neve has a burning question, which I want to okay. give Neve the chance to ask. But before that, there was a question in from um, Francis Jacobs, who I know is known to you, formerly of the EP office in Dublin. It's a rather technical one, uh, but it's a short one. Francis asks, to what extent do the voting procedures envisaged for periodic support or rejection of the Northern Ireland Protocol alarm the majority of unionists? This is given that the protocol could be confirmed by simple majority as a result of support from most nationalists, the Alliance Party, and a minority of pragmatic unionists. Do you have a view? Yeah, it's uh, technically will the, the, the whole thing can be reversed, but 
it's negotiations are going on their way at the moment. One can't be hopeful that they'll be successful, but it will be interesting to see what is the outcome. I, I'm totally puzzled because I get two stories from Northern Ireland. I get stories, and and did see see some broadcasts which covered these points that. Certainly business is very happy with the protocol. They are taking advantage of the double advantage that the people of Northern Ireland have both been in the single market, uh, European single market and been in the UK, uh, been in the UK one. But maybe they aren't raising their voices strong enough mm. to demonstrate that maybe they aren't making the effort to lead public opinion. Uh, I am aware of what, what can happen. I think if I'm right, it's in the life of the next two assemblies that a majority decision could be made to reverse right. the protocol. Well, maybe I should be consistent. Maybe the only way it can be done is by a two thirds majority. Once again, that involves cross community support. The central theme I'm trying to make and all that I ha have to say is avoid majority decisions because yeah. of our past. Let's have decisions made which involve some significant element of cross community support in it. I'd love to have had the chance to quiz you more on the compatibility of politics in Northern Ireland and the Republic. You kind of touched on it, John, there about the various kind of polling that uh, unity, yes, please, but if it'll cost us anything, I'm not so sure. I'd love to discuss that with you at some other stage, but for now, I'm just gonna ask my colleague, Niamh, you have one final question or you wanted to ask, and then we'll wrap up, Niamh. I do actually. Um, I have, I have several questions, but I will confine myself to one, Barry, otherwise I know I won't be your good fix. You won't be involved. Um, <laughs> Don't always ask me offline, Nave. That's true, that's true. I will, John, I will. Um, it's about Stormont, and clearly Stormont has gone through a, a very rocky past over the last 10 years, from the RHI scandal, uh, the liberal use of the petition of concern, for example, um, to more recently the protocol, Edwin Poots breaking international law, the resignation of Paul Given, um, and necessarily Deputy First Minister as well. Is Stormont even fixable? Or is it game over? Well, it's look, I, I don't see any. We we've talked tonight about you know border polls and creating stable institutions and on. And that shows the mess we're in in Northern Ireland. I, I don't think there's any possibility in the very near future, quite frankly, of any all Ireland settlement. And I think most people, no matter what their aspiration may be, recognize that. So I think we've got to work with what we have. And in many of the as, 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 as Barry has talked about, many of the op-ed pieces I've wrote, uh, written, I should say, is probably the more correct language uh, on this topic. The one finishing point I always made, if we can't unite Northern Ireland, how the hell can we unite Ireland? And the starting point for uniting Northern Ireland is to make an assembly based on power sharing, involving both traditions, which both sections of the community will defend united together against all who are opposed to it. So it's a question of, it has to be the first starting point. We can never give up on it. We just change the nature of it. Many soccer teams plan in the top of the premiership, many Gaelic teams uh, plan uh, become the best. All started off at the bottom, but they managed with proven success to get to the top. And I'm, I think the same sort of thing can happen in politics. We can make storm and work provided the commitment and there's sufficient persuasion, but also sufficient, sufficient pressure. Pressure, most importantly, from the bottom, but also pressure from the two governments to make sure that they make the next assembly work and don't let it. I, I just don't understand how both governments, and I'm not pushing the blame to one over the other, I'm just saying they're the guarantors, how they allowed the assembly to collapse for at least six occasions, or others would put it nine. We have to persevere with it and we've just got to change the ethos of it. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, John. I'm going to pass back over to, to Barry. Thank you so much, Niamh and Eugenio and John. John, thanks a million for your time and for your candour and indeed for your enormous contribution. It may surprise our audience that John told me that was your first speech for a while. So I hope we're looking forward to hearing, we can look forward to hearing many more now as things continue to open up because you speak an enormous amount of sense and that's reflected in, I think, the positive responses we're getting from our from our attendees so thanks a million john we look forward thanks, to thanks the opportunity and as i say you proved to me the value of academics with no vested interest trying to educate 
the, 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 the voters, and I hope you continue with it. But I hope, as I say, that it's coming under a wider umbrella, especially before the, 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 the Northern Ireland and, and the Republic of Ireland face any important decisions on the constitutional future of this island. So thank you. I, I very thank much you, I'm delighted to say, so John has been a loyal attendee at our, at our sessions, and I'm delighted that our next one will be in two weeks, and it's something a bit different. I look forward to all our meetings, but this one is something I'm very much looking forward to, which is with Lisa Dwan, who's a director, a, an actor, a professor at Princeton, and one of the, the leading interpreters of Beckett of, of our time, and she's a wonderful speaker, and she's going to reflect on something a little bit different, which is the future of, of the arts and everything that goes with that on the island of Ireland. So please join us on the 14th of March. We'll be contacted in, in the usual ways. That's it for me. Thanks very much, everybody, and enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you. Salon. Salon. Thank you.